Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Gianna Eckhart. I'm a professor of marketing here at the School of Management at Royal Holloway. And it is my pleasure to welcome you tonight to the annual sustainability lecture. Uh, I am also the director of the Center for Research in Sustainability, uh, which is housed in the School of Management here. And this is an annual lecture that we have been putting on for about uh, 12 years now. And it is um, my pleasure to, uh, to, to that we have such a wonderful speaker uh, with us tonight, Jason Lewis. Uh, I'll introduce Jason in a minute, but to tell you a little bit uh, just about our res research center while I have your attention. Um, the Center for Research and Sustainability is uh, a leading group of researchers and educators here at Royal Holloway who are trying to address different facets and challenges of sustainability through our research as well as our teaching. Uh, our research activities focus on uh, three United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which are gender equality, responsible consumption and production, and peace, justice, and strong institutions. We also teach a um, uh, specialization in sustainability at the bachelor's level, and we offer a master's degree in sustainability and management. And if anyone would like to ask me about the Research Center more, I'd be happy to talk to you after the, uh, after the talk. So, our, as I mentioned, our flagship event every year is this annual sustainability lecture, uh, where we invite a distinguished guest to discuss an important aspect of sustainability and have a uh, dialogue with the broad audience, such as yourself. Uh, and so we are honored to have Royal Holloway alumnus Jason Lewis with us tonight to continue this tradition. So Jason is an explorer and author, as well as an honorary fellow here at Royal Holloway. He's credited by the Guinness Book of World Records as the first person to circumnavigate the Earth without using motors or sails. I'm very excited to hear more about how this was accomplished. Uh, walking, cycling, inline skating, five continents, and kayaking, swimming, rowing, and pedaling a boat across the river, seas, and oceans. Um, so since his undergraduate days as a geography student here at Royal Holloway, Jason has also co-developed a range of educational programs aimed at raising young people's awareness of global sustainability issues, something that we'll talk more about tonight as well. Um, so please join me in welcoming Jason. <laughs> So the format tonight is that Jason and I will have uh, a conversation about uh, some of his past and future expeditions for about 40 minutes and then we'll have about uh, 15 minutes for, uh, to open up the conversation um, to all of us for you guys to ask questions and contribute to the discussion. Um, so Jason, I like to think of myself as an adventurous traveler. <laughs> I was uh, riding camels on the desert in Morocco recently. I've gone uh, kayaking down some unexplored rivers in Colombia. Um, gone to uh, visit uh, different ruins in Cambodia. But I feel like reading about what you've done is uh, at a whole other level. <laughs> so <laughs> can you uh, tell us how you got started uh, doing expeditions? Well, it was um, meeting a, a fellow undergrad geography under, undergraduate student here at Holloway, um, Stevie Smith. And when we were here at college, I have to say we were pretty bad students, at least for the <laughs> first year, certainly. Um, and we, I mean, Holloway is, is a sort of a lovely place because, um, as I was just talking about uh, with someone earlier, you, it's, it's one of these places where you have a sort of a family feel and... Um, at least for the first year, there wasn't a huge amount of pressure. So we, at least academically, so we would take off on these weekend mini expeditions. We would jump on the train, go off, um, to get off at a random station somewhere and just start walking. And I think it was um, the fact that Holloway is, uh, where, it is where it's situated here. It's out of London that you can just get out into the outdoors pretty quickly. That was sort of a great incentive for me to get interested in sort of outdoor activities. Anyway, years later, um, Stevie, who went on to work for the OECD in uh, Brussels, uh, working in green labeling as an environmental scientist, he, uh, I think, became a bit disillusioned with what he was doing. Um, the economists at the OECD said, you know what, the idea of a sustainable future, a habitable planet is a lovely idea, but we actually can't afford it. Um, so he, uh, he became disillusioned and he left that job and I get a call one day and from him saying, you know, I've got this idea to do this 
amazing expedition that will show what you can do without burning fossil fuels around the planet by human power. Would you join me? And I thought, well, why is he asking me? You know, I'm just, neither of us had any real experience as so-called explorers. But uh, it just sounded like a fabulously simple um, idea. So I, so I agreed to join. Wow, and how did you guys decide to do this via human-powered um, circumnavigation? So the idea, well, the, the, the premise was rooted in the, in the concept of, uh, this is a, a slide of Ferdinand Magellan's expedition to go around the planet. Back in 1522, he was the first to circumnavigate um, using the power of the, w of, of the wind. So uh, he was actually trying to get fabulously rich by uh, taking five ships to present-day Philippines where he could load up on spices, things that weren't readily available, um, like pepper, cloves, cinnamon, um, that weren't read readily available in, in Europe at the time. And if he could make it back to, uh, to Europe, then he would become very rich. He actually was killed en route, but 15, uh, 18 members of his expedition finally made it back and they were the first to circumnavigate using the power of the wind. And since the Industrial Revolution, people have gone around the planet using everything from uh, airplanes, motorboats, even hot air balloons. Stevie's idea was uh, to, which hadn't, amazingly, hadn't been thought of uh, in 1991, I think is when he thought of this, was uh, to use the cheapest, uh, the easiest mode of propulsion of all, just the power of the human body no motors, no sails, so walking, biking, rollerblading over land, uh, kayaking between the islands and swimming uh, the rivers. So the primary aim was to, yeah, do a first, which hadn't been done before, but also we, uh, I, I touched upon, um, he wanted to make a statement of what was possible without using fossil fuels, and also uh, we were both quite interested in, and this really goes back to our studies here at, at, at Royal Holloway, Having done geography, I started off in biology and ended up in geography, and I think he, yeah, he was geography, and we were both interested in uh, humans, the societies that they create, and the natural world that ultimately supports those human societies. And we didn't know it at the time, but um, we were, I, I, I guess we were both interested in sustainability, which is, which is why we're here tonight. Great, and so as well as the land sections, you need to cross the oceans without the assistance from wind and motors. So how did you get around that problem? What did you do? So this was the thing. So we sat down over around a map at two o'clock in the morning, few too many beers, as very often happens with these things. And um, I remember he showed me, uh, we sort of ended up looking at this rather large blue area that <laughs> took up half the planet. Um, and I remember saying to him, so Stevie, um, this, this, he said, oh yeah, the big wet bit, the Pacific. I said, yeah, that, that's a pretty big wet bit. Um, 10,000 miles across. Uh, how do we get across that by human power? And he said, oh, it's easy. We'll just kayak. <laughs> and I then had to remind him that neither of us had actually kayaked before, um, but this didn't really phase him. He said, kayaking, how hard could it be? I mean, all you're basically doing is going like this for a very long time. Um, but you'll get there eventually. So we had really no, f not the faintest idea of what we were getting into. Fortunately for us and our families, two friends of ours, Chris and Hugo, who had recently finished a wooden boat building course, proposed a much more sensible way of crossing the big wet bit <laughs> and the other big wet bits, the Atlantic and the Pacific and the Indian Oceans. Um, so Chris and Hugo built a 26 foot, eight meter long boat made out of wood that could carry enough food and other provisions for two people to survive up to 150 days without resupply. One person would pedal, the other could uh, sit opposite. They could uh, make food, navigate um, when they weren't pedaling. And in the front of the boat, the, there's a forward sleeping compartment. So you can stretch out full length uh, to sleep. And the reason why we chose a pedal powered boat versus a rowing boat uh, is because, um, partly because at the end of each land section of uh, bike riding, for example, we would be really fit for the ocean sections, but also we could have a sliding hatch which could be closed in heavy weather, whereas in a rowing boat you have to, you're basically exposed to the elements all the time. So, so that's kind of why we, um, why we chose 
uh, a pedal boat. Uh, the only thing that Chris and Hugo did not tell us, though, before they started building this boat was they had never built a boat before. <laughs> so we needed, here's a tiny bit of video clip, a tiny uh, little bit of video of us uh, testing moksha. We call the boat moksha, which means liberation in Sanskrit. Here's, here's uh, testing moksha before we actually set off from, uh, from, from uh, London. <laughs> And that, believe it or not, was me about a million years ago when I had a full head of hair. <laughs> so it's pretty sad to date since. <laughs> yeah. Well, it seems like an ingenious design. It must have worked in the end. Yeah, it did. Yes. I mean, it was, she was an amazing boat. Um, and we didn't know at the time uh, when we set off from Portugal that she would be able to weather the big storms, yeah. but she was a really, really good design, yeah. Wow. So then, so pedaling across the ocean was the first... Um, you know, major leg that you did. How was it uh, adapting to life in a small boat? So it's pretty, uh, very quickly your universe shrinks around you. Um, and of course, uh, food is a biggie. So uh, all of our food on that particular crossing was uh, dehydrated British army rations oh. that my dad managed to get <laughs> donated for free, which was great because otherwise the stuff was really expensive to buy. Um, but it wasn't until we were a week into the voyage that we discovered why the British Army had donated it all for free. <laughs> it was all 10 years out of date. Um, very good, very nice. But we had one sponsor in the form of Mars UK who gave us 4,000 Mars bars to eat to cross the Atlantic. So, so when, I give, when I go to primary schools, they all think that's absolutely fantastic. They all want to become an explorer after that. Um, <laughs> But yeah, on later voyages, because the amount of packaging and plastics involved in, in, in food like this, we, on later voyages, we, we did our own food preparation so we could cut down on all the plastics, for example, involved in, in packaging dehydrated food. Water was a biggie, um, so we had a, the boat wasn't big enough to carry all the water that we needed, so we had to make the water as we went along uh, using a desalinator pump. But quite laborious, though, for one hour of pumping, um, we got... Um, four liters, typically a gallon of fresh water. Um, and our, our energy was, um, we got from a wind generator uh, and solar panels to generate enough electricity to run um, a VHF radio and uh, a navigation light. So that was kind of, but the whole, the whole idea is the boat becomes a, it really is a little sort of a microcosm of the planet um, in terms of just your universe is, you know, the limits of your universe are just very immediate. And so it's really amazing. You do become quite um, conscious, I suppose, of, of, of how much you're consuming, whether, whether it's water or energy or, um, or food or any of these things. I can imagine. And at the risk of being indelicate, were there any uh, private areas when you needed to get rid of waste? <laughs> So that's the, that's the interesting thing. I'm actually, actually going on another expedition next year, and my wife, Tammy, is joining me. And this is one of the <laughs> hot topics of uh, a conversation around the dinner table. Is I said, I'm just like, hang off the side of the boat, let it yeah. go, and... I refuse to poo in the ocean. <laughs> so she's talking about bringing a composting toilet along, but there's just no room, sweetheart, really. <laughs> just no room. It's quite rude. <laughs> <laughs> we who are about to die can eat this. <laughs> so how long did uh, did your whole circumnavigation take? Thirteen years in the end. Thirteen yeah. years. Yeah, I know it's ridiculous, isn't it? <laughs> We're supposed to take three or four year, three or four years, and because of various mishaps along the way. Uh, I, I was run over by a drunk driver in Colorado. Uh, also, we had various, we had one particular leg that had to be aborted down through Central America that because of El Nino on that particular, in that particular year, it, the winds and currents had been reversed off South America, so we had, that was a year wasted. Um, also, just funding, we just uh, really had a hard time raising the means to keep going just because, for example, we arrived in Miami after being on the Atlantic for three and a half months. We arrived in Miami, and I think we had $50 between us. And so we then had to, you know, go out, network through organic fundraising, 
uh, mechanisms like doing talks for rotary clubs, or yacht clubs, or whatever. We sold T-shirts, names on the boat for twenty dollars. So that actually sort of we we had to we became quite good at um, fundraising and lots of different hats that you had to wear. It wasn't just about peddling or about doing an expedition. It was all these other skills that actually we had to develop in order to actually do the thing. And were there any moments when you felt like giving up? <coughs> oh, many, yeah. Uh, I mean, the worst was probably crossing the Pacific, which was 178 days pedaling. And in the middle of the Pacific, and actually by this point, Stevie had left the expedition. And uh, there's, a <coughs> there's, a, there's an area of the Central Pacific known as the doldrums, or the intertropical convergence zone, where the water runs back eastwards. So it's a countercurrent if you're trying to get to Australia. And I spent a month pedaling on the spot, going nowhere. And uh, I wanted to give up because it was just soul destroying. I mean, I would pedal for 18 hours a day, and I would uh, um, then have to sleep for a few hours. And then when I woke up, I would s switch on the GPS, and I was back where I started the previous morning. And that went on day after day after day. And it was just mind crushingly depressing, um, but I had to keep going because if I didn't go, if I didn't pedal and at least maintain my position, the boat would be going backwards okay. in the countercurrent and I would eventually run out of food and water. How did you get out of the doldrums? Just, um, just pedaling on the spot. Eventually, um, the, the doldrums will actually fluctuate in terms of the width and sometimes they'll actually um, deviate north and south and wow. And eventually, the southern edge of the of the of the countercurrent came up to reach me, um, because of a seasonal fluctuation, just pure luck. And then I was able to get into the southern hemisphere and, and get to Australia. So, but you know, I I didn't know. I have a friend who actually tried to row across the Pacific a few years ago, and he never got across the doldrums, and he was stuck in it for six months, and eventually had to be rescued off Papua New Guinea. So, um, wow. yeah, it's. The, but that was probably one of the worst, one, 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 one of the worst times. <laughs> I can imagine. And what were some of the best experiences? Um, well, I love the wilderness. I didn't know that I would love the wilderness before I set out on this thing. But um, I remember uh, actually as a, as a kid um, wondering, I, I always remember thinking, what would it be like for someone visiting this planet uh, an outside visitor, what would, they th what would they make of humans and what would they make of our ability to take care of our planet? And I always wondered, I wonder, how, I wonder if it's possible to, you know, how would you, um, what, would that, what would that foreign entity, what would they make of us? And I thought the closest you're going to get to that as a human is by stepping outside of society. And so I loved just getting away from civilization, being in this little isolation pod. And it's amazing, once you're out at sea for a month, more than a month, you're sent, everything, starts you're, you're, everything starts sort of shrinking around you. And so your sensory spectrum narrows very quickly. And a lot of the um, kind of, I, I suppose, the, the facets of your own personality, who you think you are, uh, a lot of that starts to drop away b because you don't have those reinforcing factors around you. So, for example, even language. I mean, we stopped using language after a while. And, um, and I got to see how, in a way, all of us are a product of our geography. And the only way to know that is by stepping outside of where you normally live and going to one of these very empty spaces. And there you get to see how much of a product of the, a particular part of the world you are in terms of your conditioning from your schooling, from media, from your parenting, from, from everything. It, 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 that produces who we think we are. And also gives us, also of course, depending on where we grow up in the world, it gives us a lot of prejudices and biases. Christian, Buddhist, American, uh, English, Republican, Democrat, whatever it might be, and these are all so, and it's not until you get out there and all of 
that noise, that social noise kind of drops away, that you realize that these are all just illusions. They're all just m mental constructs. And uh, I think that it, being out there on the ocean allowed me to become hopefully a more open-minded person and to be able to see my own sense of cultural self more objectively. Yeah, as a bit of a long round, long-winded <laughs> way round to your to your question. No, it's very interesting. It reminds me of uh, Thoreau's writings about uh, on how the a human can find their true nature by being alone in the wilderness, and it sounds like that was your experience. Yeah, correct. And I think it's I think it's uh, was it was a, and uh, we didn't know how we would react. Stevie didn't have such a good crossing because he was always obsessing. I think about getting to land. Uh, and I just happen to love being out there and, and that wilderness immersion. Uh, were there any other um, interesting experiences uh, besides the doldrums, specific things that you hit while you were there? Yeah, we had some pretty um, exciting uh, moments. Um, I should mention also after a month at sea, you'll get these horrible things called salt sores, which are sweat pores that become uh, basically blocked with salt, and then they can become in fully infected and develop into, into full-blown salt sores. So these, these are, this is some, one of the not-so-great aspects of being at sea, where, you, where you're not able to wash that frequently. So our little water pump, we produced, I think, three gallons of water a day would produce our basic living needs for just cooking and drinking, but there wasn't enough, for example, for washing off the salt. So this was one of the not-so-great uh, aspects. Also, living in a com very com uh, confined space, it's intense. I mean, we were within five feet of each other all the time, and everything becomes a shared experience. I mean, literally everything. Yeah. <laughs> and um, the little things start to kind of build up, little sort of annoyances that you wouldn't make a big deal of on land, because you can just leave the house and, you know, we have a domestic, you can just leave the house and you can get, you can get space. But for us, um, they sort of built up and built up. And the straw that broke the camel's back was the way that we did our laundry. And as you can see from this slide, it, it, I'm using the term pretty loosely, because laws, laundry for us involved just tying what few clothes we had at the end of a month and a half at sea onto a length of rope and towing them behind the boat for a few hours, which made absolutely no difference to how filthy they were, but it gave <laughs> us the sense that we were keeping on top of things psychologically. And one, one day I forgot about my laundry and... Um, uh, all together, and I, the first I knew of this was Steve pulling in these clothes of mine and holding them up to my face accusingly and saying, Jason, do you know how long you've had your, your laundry out there for? And I, I had no idea, and, and he said, three days. <laughs> and I've worked something out, smart guy, that at, at a quarter of a knot's drag over three days, that's an extra 12 miles we're going to have to pedal on this ocean because of your wretched underpants. <laughs> And I thought this was the most ridiculous thing I'd ever heard. And so we had a massive row, which was really good, what we needed to do. Um, and, but this sort of dovetailed into what happened a, a few days later, because we had a storm that came through, and the waves got big. And in these kind of conditions, um, it's, the reason why we have a car tire there is because in heavy See, heavy conditions, we would have a, a, long, lo a long rope, a 150-meter uh, length of rope, and we'd tie one of these car tires on the end of the rope, and that would keep the boat heading perpendicular to the waves, so there was less chance of, of broaching, of turning parallel to the waves, and then being capsized. Anyway, a, a few minutes after I took this photograph, um, we switched positions. So Steve was um, standing in the hatchway there making water, and I was... Um, pedaling, and I felt something called a rogue wave come up behind the boat, which is a wave that's typically twice as big as any other wave in the surrounding ocean, and it's caused by a confluence of wind and current. The w anyway, the, the boat was vertical on the front of this wave, and I'm thinking in my mind, this is when the, f the boat will pitch pole, which is when the stern flips over the bow. Not a good thing to happen if you have the hatch open like we stupidly did. And at the last second, though, the boat shot down the front of this wave, and uh, I lost all control of the steering, which works a bit like a go-kart. You've got a, a couple of steering toggles connected by a rope back to the rudder. I lost control of the steering. The boat then turned around to the left to port, and it flipped and capsized. 
And then uh, all I remember was being upside down. The water was planing and I couldn't see anything. And again, I'm thinking this is when the boat will fill up with water and will drown. And then the boat self-righted as it was designed to do. Um, and there was general chaos inside the boat. It was half full of water, pots and pans clanking around. Um, but I tried the electrics, the electrics worked, that was good, and at least the boat was afloat. That was the main thing. If the boat floats, then you survive uh, as a human being out on the ocean, because otherwise you don't, you don't last very long. And then I noticed there was something quite sort of majorly missing from the whole picture, and Steve, gone, overboard. Yes, brilliant. <laughs> Absolutely fat. Just for a moment, I cannot deny there was a little sort of fleeting moment of bliss that he was gone because we just really didn't like each other at this point. Uh, quickly followed by this terrible realization that if he's gone overboard in these kind of seas, it sees it'll be very hard to get him back because if you're gu if you're the guy in the water, the boat will be pushed by the wind and the waves quicker than you can swim after it, and if you're the guy pedaling like I was, you just don't have the horsepower to turn that long, narrow boat around into a following sea to go back and get someone. You end up just pedaling further away from the person in the water. So uh, I was looking in the shining ocean for something I could throw another rope to, like a hand or a head or anything, and, and uh, after f several minutes, I concluded that he had been maybe knocked unconscious and he drowned, and then um, I heard this knocking sound on the, on the hull, and I looked down towards the rudder, and there was this coconut bobbing by the rudder, rudder. And I thought, that's weird to have a coconut this far from land, like 1,500 miles from land at this point. And then I looked a bit closer, and I realized that I was actually looking at the top of Stevie's bald head. <laughs> and, um, and then he turned to look at me, and he had this uh, expression like he'd just seen death, absolute terror. What had happened was he was about 100 meters away from the boat, watching it get smaller and smaller, thinking in his head that he's just going to swim and swim until he gets too tired, and then he'll just slip, below, slip beneath, uh, uh, beneath the, the waves. And he felt something brush against the lower part of his leg, and he reached down, and it was the rope that we had trailing out the back connected to the car tire, and he was then able to pull himself back to the boat. So that was a really, really lucky one. And, you know, we were, I think, a bit nice to each other, nicer to each other for a few days after that. Good, I'm yeah. glad to hear that. <laughs> well, I, for one, am so relieved that Steve is alive. <laughs> and we also know that Tammy has salt sores to look forward to <laughs> on the next expedition. Whew, okay, now that I'm calmer. Um, so did you see any pollution while you were out on the ocean? We did, um, not as much as you might think, because a lot of plastic pollution, I know everyone now is quite galvanized about plastic, single-use plastics now in this country, um, but yeah, this is the amount of plastics that we produced after 111 days at sea, uh, and as you can see, it, it filled up most of our boat after being out there for that long, so that was why we changed um, the whole arrangements for future voyages because the amount of plastic that, that we were producing. But um, yeah, crossing the Pacific, uh, there was very obvious signs of uh, plastics on some of the islands that we stopped off at, in particular Tarawa in the Republic of Kiribati, the Solomon Islands. Um, also a big problem for, the, for these people on some of these low-lying islands is now sea level rise. Uh, I have friends on the island of Tarawa that are spending a lot of their time right now showing up their, their houses from uh, coastal erosion, from sea level rise. But yeah, as, as some of you I'm sure already know, the amount of plastic in the Pacific um, that accumulates in these gyres is something like 2.5 million square kilometers, um, four times the size of Texas. And the plastic just gets smaller and smaller um, until you can't even see it anymore. Uh, and that, of course, causes a problem for some of the animals that we encountered along the way in a really obvious way. Uh, also, um, this, is, this is actually a killer whale that was washed up on the island of Tari in the Western Isles a few years ago that ended up having some, a very, very high level of chemical called PCB, 
polychlorinated biphenyl, which used to, we used to have in electronics, I guess, back in the 70s until it was banned, but it's still leaching out of landfills. And through biomagnification, because the small plastics that are in the ocean are, of course, eaten by the fish, and then the fish are eaten by predators until, the, until those chemicals get driven up the food chain into these top, top line predators. So yeah, plastic was, was, um, was pretty obvious to us. Not so much in the water, but definitely on the beaches of the island that we, but some of the islands that we stopped off at. Mm. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm not surprised to hear that, uh, given a lot of the exposés about plastics uh, in the ocean. Um, so to talk a little bit about how your adventures relate to sustainability, can you tell us a little bit about the educational components of your expeditions? Yeah, so to tell that story, I mean, this is kind of comes, comes back to, um, I suppose, Holloway, really, Royal, Royal, Royal Holloway here. Um, I mean, by the time we reached Miami, Steve and I really couldn't stand the sight of each other. So that's why there are two lines going across the United <laughs> States. Um, and I had this idea um, that I wanted to rollerblade across the states, which I had never rollerbladed before. But and Steve more sensibly decided to use a bicycle. Um, but this segues into I've got a little bit of video. I've got a little video clip that segues into the answer to your question about the educational outreach programs. Sure. It's all about technique going up here on skates. If you get the right technique, it's actually not that hard at all. Unfortunately, I haven't got the technique. By the time Steve was approaching the west coast, Jason was only halfway and in serious trouble. He was hit by a car whilst rollerblading in Colorado. Both his legs were shattered and he was lucky to be alive. So I had been hit by an 82-year-old drunk driver with cataracts. Both legs broken ended up going to the, hosp the, ho uh, the hospital in the local town of Pueblo. And um, I didn't know anyone in this town at all. So my surgeon um, said, you know, once you get discharged from hospital, uh, I've got this little cabin up in the Rockies that you can go and stay, stay in. Um, my, you know, my family and I just use it once every few weeks. And so I ended up staying there for nine months recuperating. And the only thing the doctor asked was that we look after his 90-odd head of North American bison, which seemed a pretty reasonable trade. <laughs> so Steve's father, Stuart, actually came to look after me while I was in the wheelchair. But anyway, to answer your question, because I had time on my hands now, um, Stevie actually had arrived in San Francisco, but I had to, so he kindly waited for me in, in, in uh, San Francisco. But we took, we got the boat up from Miami, took it around to local schools, and ended up working with teachers on developing a range of educational programs, um, specifically uh, connected to world citizenship. So we had a relationship with UNESCO at that time. So we connected with, I think, three, 900 odd schools in 37 countries, uh, getting, ch giving children, for example, video cameras. This was a pre-YouTube era. So we gave them video cameras. They would make films about their, their life, and we would exchange those, um, those vignettes, if you like, between kids of different cultures. Obviously, it had to be translated as well. Um, also, I was quite um, affected by a book by um, William Rees and Mathis Wackenagel, Our Ecological Footprint, which was kind of, sort of an early um, rallying call, if you like, for um, environmental sustainability. So that, we also developed a program around ecological footprints for the, for the Pacific voyage. So we, for example, on Moksha would be um, looking at our food, water, energy consumption, and we would, take me we would measure our footprint, essentially, and classrooms would be doing the same thing, and then we would be able to do compare and contrast analysis with, um, with classrooms from different cultures. And of course, it was quite interesting because um, typically the, more, the kids from more affluent societies had a greater impact, as you might expect. Great, and how did you integrate sustainability into your expeditions? So I was um, greatly affected by Jared Diamond, Jared, Jared, Jared Diamond's he, work. He wrote Guns, Germs, and Steel, right? Guns, Germs, and Steel, exactly, and then um, a book called Collapse. And he, I don't know if he's still now the professor of geography at UCLA, but um, anyway, one story that really um, 
kind of affected me, and I think Stevie as well, was the story of Easter Island. Does anybody here know, I, I'm guessing quite a few of you know of Diamond's work? Yeah? Um, so G Diamond had this, he, he looked at different societies, um, indigenous so uh, societies, and, uh, and he looked at why some of them uh, chose to succeed and how others weren't sustainable, essentially. And the, one of the, the story of Easter Island was, I think, a really powerful one. His, his theory was that the people, the environmental degradation brought about by the people themselves caused their ultimate de demise, which is, I know there have been the sort of, uh, there have been criticisms of that theory because there were other factors as well, perhaps, that he didn't take into account. But the idea, so the, just to give you a, just in a nutshell for people who aren't familiar with Easter Island's story, um, it's a 66 square mile island in the South Pacific, um, originally populated by Polynesians migrating across the Pacific in canoes. And at one point, we had something like 20,000 people living on the island. Um, but within just a few hundred years, only 111 people were left alive. What happened? Um, Diamond's theory is that uh, it's a lot to do with the statues, the, the Moai, that represent ans the ancestors of the chiefs, the 12 chiefs that once ruled the island. And as the chiefs became more powerful, they demanded bigger and more impressive moai to be built in their honor, which in turn required more and more trees to transport the moai from the central quarry to their various locations around the outside of the island. The problem with that was that the local people also needed trees for building canoes for fishing so they could uh, supplement their diet in terms of protein. So um, the soil on on Rapa Nui is, 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 is not very good. It's a young volcanic island, so it wasn't really conducive for intensive agriculture. So anyway, the, <coughs> uh, the scenario was that people, of course, became more and more hungry, and according to the kitchen middens, the archaeological sites, um, things descended into, uh, as resources became more and more, um, more and more um, um, f fewer than people resorted to warfare and it was a fairly kind of chaotic situation, even examples of, of, of a cannibalism as well. So what has this got to do with us in modern societies? Well, uh, Easter Island is one of, the, one of the most remote islands in the world. It's surrounded on all sides by water. So when they reached crisis point, the people couldn't evacuate to relieve population pressure because they didn't have canoes anymore and neither could they import resources to prevent the decimation of their animal and plant species. And so, of course, this is a, a closed system. The island is a, is a closed system, and our planet is also a, a closed system whereby, instead of being surrounded by, or rather cut off by water, we're cut off by space. But I just felt that Easter Island was, uh, is, is, is really sort of a rather sobering analogy perhaps for our, for our planet and why global sustainability I think is, is the question of our time perhaps without sounding too overly dramatic. Yeah, no, I agree and we'll, we'll come back to that um, uh, in a minute for sure. Um, so you mentioned that it took you 13 years to uh, do your circumnavigation. What was it like coming back to the UK uh, after 13 years? Yeah, it was um, quite surreal because I'd been away from home for so long. And I think peddling moksha back up the River Thames, uh, there were very obvious signs that this country had become really quite affluent in the Blair years. Um, the Canary Wharf was all built up. There was the Millennium Dome there that, I mean, all these things that I hadn't seen before and, and it was it was quite weird. I mean, I've got a couple of friends here tonight, Lofty and Marge, and I, you'd you'd, you'd all, uh, I mean, you'd also grown up and mar got married and had kids and and uh, and I suppose my my kind of perception of home had remained fixed in my head, but of course I might as well have been dead for 13 years because life moves on and life is for the living and and it was I realised that. Um, in a way, I didn't even feel like England was home anymore. So I ended up in the US, where I had more of a support base there in Colorado. That's where I met Tammy. And, um, and so that became my home from home 
at least to write my book and uh, try and figure out what I wanted to do next. Mm. And so what were your main takeaways from, from your circumnavigation? So I have always, for a long time now, I have been sort of obsessed with a question, which is, is it possible to, for us to know what a sustainable lifestyle might look like? In terms of what would a, you know, we know how, I know what it was like on the boat. I mean, we know how certain in people have managed it you know, on small islands in the South Pacific, for example. But how do we in modern society, how do we live a sustainable lifestyle? How do we become part of the solution to a sustainable future, not part of the problem? And to cut a long story short, I went away, wrote my book. And through the writing of my book, I realized that actually the answer had been under my nose from the very beginning. Moksha, that little life support machine, was really the metaphor, or rather the, the, the teacher for me, um, because um, in many ways she represented the planet in miniature. So for a lot of the adaptations that I'd made to survive on that, on that little boat were, I realized, the adaptations that I need to apply to my life and maybe other, people's, uh, other people could apply them as well to life back in modern society. So things like, and we've already kind of mentioned them or, or touched on them, things like w energy, uh, sorry, food, um, just becoming mindful of uh, food consumption so that I didn't run out of food before the end of a voyage. Um, also water, um, when you have to pump that handle for an hour to produce just one gallon of fresh water. You really appreciate how uh, precious fresh drinking water is. Energy, again, um, when your energy comes from re renewable energy sources, you don't have any recourse for, you know, from uh, fossil fuel energy. You really have to think about uh, turning on a light switch in the boat. Um, and we always used to pedal the boat uh, at night in complete darkness unless we saw, saw another ship coming towards us. And only then would we turn on the navigation lights, for example. And trash, r rubbish, you know, you, you become very aware. Once your little universe, your planet starts filling up with plastic, you realize this cannot carry on. We can't, you know, I if the voyage is indefinite, you'll end up, there's nowhere to be on the boat anymore. And fixing things, that was another great lesson for me, was Real, it was having to fix things. So, for example, the water maker broke down on the Arabian Sea crossing numerous times, and the only thing that I could fix it with was metal, because the plastic uh, housing had fractured from, from fatigue. So first I cut up my, uh, my tin plates, but they weren't strong enough. Then the uh, aluminum plates, and finally the only metal left on board the boat was the brass name plaque of the boat, of, of, of the boat itself. And, and that's what kept the water maker going until I reached landfall. So I guess those, that was the main takeaway, was applying the lessons from this small boat uh, to my life on land, scaling down, minimizing, just an, an exercising mindful restraint. Yeah, I understand. Um, my colleague Katerina and I have been studying the pilgrimage route of the Camino de Santiago in Spain. And when you walk that, you typically have a very small backpack. And so the amount of things that you bring with you uh, is, is quite small and there's because it's in rural areas there's really no place to restock and one of the things that so many pilgrims say at the end is it, they reinforce the message that you just said which is I realized I didn't need that much uh, to live and this is a lesson and, and that I can fix things when I need to I don't have to buy something new and this is the, like one of the main lessons they want to take back to their real life uh, at home and so it's great yeah to have these types of different spaces and adventures to, to go on to, to internalize that lesson. Do you think it's realistic though to be able to apply, I mean as far as applying lessons in terms of scaling down and minimizing, do you think people are really interested in that though in modern society? It seems like we're almost going in the opposite direction in terms of mass consumption. Yeah, that, that's why I was emphasizing the, this idea that when you are on a boat on the sea or you are walking on a pilgrimage, somehow it seems feasible and you can do it and you feel, yeah, so mindful about what you're doing. But it's, yeah, it's really hard to implement it when the values that are stressed in the larger society aren't necessarily towards achieving those types of goals. So I think people find it really difficult and in fact, 
a lot of the pilgrims that we talked to talked about, well, after two years, I had to come back and do it again because I realized that I wasn't living in my regular life the way that I wanted to, and I wanted to come back and try and reinforce these messages again. Uh, and so, yeah, I think it's very, very difficult to sort of transfer some of that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think it's quite, I mean, there's so much noise out there as well these days, isn't there, in terms of um, yeah. time. Time seems to be an incredibly, we have all these modern contraptions to, to, um, to make our lives easier, but they seem to, if anything, we seem to have less time, and yet we have to go out on a, out to an ocean or out on, on a pilgrimage in order to wrestle back time. Um, anyway, I'm just, it's, it's, it, it's, it's difficult because a lot of these devices that we use also, the digital age, they're supposed to save us time, but um, we, we seem to be hard, more hard pressed than ever. Yeah, people have less time than ever, I know. Yeah. Well, I think, well, I think we're both quite interested in ways that perhaps society could, could change. So let's talk a little bit about um, your future plans and how they might relate to, yeah, trying to look at different types of societies and how they live. Mm -hmm. So I would like next year uh, to um, take Moksha again. Uh, so I was looking at some of the some of the societies that um, I encountered on my circumnavigation route um, that I didn't really have a lot of time to spend with. Um, they seem to exhibit, exhibit a lot of interesting practices and techniques and uh, just uh, approaches to living within finite means. I had my sort of epiphany, if you like, being on the ocean in this boat. But I, I think it is quite difficult for people to relate to, you know, being on a pedal boat for, you know, 106 six months, you know, who is going to ever have the time to do that kind of thing? So I'm looking, I was, I'm looking for other examples of people who still live within finite means. Um, and so there are, there are some societies that are able to, that still do that. Um, there's an interesting one, uh, though these are actually some uh, societies that um, I've sort of identified as so-called micro-Earths. Um, there's some interesting people who live in the Tar Desert, for example, in Rajasthan, uh, who uh, still live rel relatively sustainably. And all these people are cut off. The reason why I call them micro-Earths is because they're cut off from the outside world, either by ocean or by desert or by mountain ranges or by other forms of geography. Um, but the one in particular that Tammy and I will be going to next year is uh, this little island called Tikapia. It's about 700 miles west of Fiji, um, between Fiji and uh, the Solomon Islands. Um, it is referenced in Jared Diamond's book, Collapse, as well, as an example of a society that's chosen, sustainability, uh, so chosen to be sustainable. And so I'm really interested to go there and, and see if we can learn anything from, see if there are any generic lessons um, and techniques and wisdom that we can perhaps apply to our modern lives here in complex societies that we've perhaps forgotten in the last, well, since the Industrial Revolution, I suppose. Mm. So, so that's the plan. And what's the significance of Tikopia? What, what, did, what are the elements of society that lead them to, to, to for Jared um, uh, Diamond, um, for example, to describe them as being sustainable? So he uses that, Tikopia as an example, as, as as a, as a society that seems to work quite well in terms of top-down top down management and bottom-up management. So there are four chiefs there, and they are essentially the, um, the, the governors. So they will, for example, land ownership is, is, a, is everything to these people because through land ownership, that's where people get their food from um, and their ability to sustain their families. Um, and so land and the surrounding ocean where people can... Uh, fish for uh, seafood and get protein that way. Um, so uh, I think there's, but the people, there's, there's 1,200 people who live there. Um, they're divided into these f uh, various clans under four chiefs. Um, they, for example, they, they killed all their large livestock back in the 1600s because they were finding that the livestock, especially the pigs, were competing with humans for food. Also, they figured out that if you had to, pe if you had to feed a pig 10 pounds of crop, 10, 10 pounds of material, of vegetable matter, 
to get one pound of pork. Why not just feed that, that same material to humans? So they figured out quite early that meat, uh, the meat, sort of meat and dairy, I'm assuming, you know, wasn't actually the, the best way to go, and perhaps more of a plant-based diet and supplemented with, with fish and other, um, other uh, sea products from the sea was the way to go. So I think that's quite interesting, perhaps. Yeah, they sound like a very progressive, uh, very progressive society. Um, so can you tell us a, a, a little bit about what your plans are? What will you do while you're in Tikopia? So the idea is to, uh, Tammy and I will pedal there. It'll take, I think, two and a half weeks, three weeks to pedal from Fiji. Um, <laughs> you look at her face. <laughs> we're gonna spend about a month there. Uh, we're gonna make a film, um, a documentary series, and uh, we're basically going to live with these people and try to, uh, I think the key thing is this, this is not a sort of a strictly scientific um, research project. What we're trying to do, I think, is, is identify some really compelling characters um, who will be able to share with us how they've lived sustainably for the last 3,000 years. Um, so the chiefs are, of course, they're the, they're the holders of this knowledge. They, uh, they, they're the ones who advise the people and they also uh, incentivize, I guess, certain behaviors uh, amongst the people. Um, they'll also, you know, they will, even though, for example, the land is, a lot of it's communal, uh, the chiefs are the ones that actually regulate, you know, people's behavior in terms of overutilization of resources. They will be able to set taboos as their known restrictions if a certain resource gets uh, over, over, overutilized. Um, and so we're going to look at, we're going to make a film really about some of these really key uh, people. And my, I guess my interest is, I know sustainability is sometimes quite a nebulous concept for people, especially global sustainability. Like, what does that mean? And individually, like, how can I be part of the solution to that, to some of these problems? I think people have a, have a tough time with that, making the f connection between themselves and the big picture. Um, I think that storytelling has a big role to play in that. So when we, for example, watch a program about um, ocean plastics and we have a, someone like David, a David Attenborough narrating it and presenting it and we see uh, a whale and its calf and the struggles that they've had, that they have with ocean, with ingesting plastics, somehow uh, that has galvanized this country, it seems. That program, that, that, that narrative has really got people fired up. And now we're starting to see legislative change um, and governmental, you know, governmental change. And that's kind of what we need, but it's how to get public opinion to, to really kind of get engaged in the meantime. And I think, uh, st so storytelling devices, I think, has a big part to play in that. I think research absolutely supports that, that compelling narratives and allowing people to feel like it's a personal issue rather than a yeah, very abstract global issue is, is what will galvanize them. And yeah, I think about the, the ban on plastic straws in London and things like that that have come out since, as you mentioned, uh, the, the BBC documentary. So I hope there's a similar result. Um, and we will all certainly be looking uh, for your film on Tikopia soon. Um, I'm cognizant of the time, and I want to make sure that there's plenty of time for you guys to ask all, Jason all of your burning questions. Um, so let's, why don't we do that first before we, uh, before we finish up. So if you want to raise your hand, we'll bring a, uh, a microphone to you, and um, please feel free to ask uh, Jason uh, and any, uh, any burning questions you have about his adventures and uh, his upcoming plans. Hi, uh, as the current head of the geography department, uh, nice to know that geographers get to do some even more exciting things once they leave Royal Holloway. Um, I think this, this sounds a really interesting thing and the whole idea about trying to get those local narratives to try and um, send out messages to how people could live differently is great. 
how do you deal with the fact that actually publicising the beautiful environmental sustainability and social wonderfulness of Tikopia could potentially have negative impacts? On the people themselves? Yeah. Well, I'm very, very aware that, uh, that an intrusion... I mean, these people have been visited before. Um, there, there has actually been, I think, two other programmes that have been made there, one by a Norwegian uh, filmmaker for, children, for children's TV and um, also a French film that I think is coming out next year. And uh, I think it obviously would be hugely irresponsible if these people were uncontacted. Um, and so it's a, it's, it's a tricky one. I'm, I'm hoping that, the, that, the, that we have to, obviously, we, we have permission to go there from the chiefs because they, um, you know, they do have people who just roll up in sailboats and um, I'm sure they're sick of outsiders already. Um, but I, I, the, the, the idea here is to, I think the people's lifestyle is changing already, inevitably, through globalization. So they get a ship once every year to, uh, to 18 months. And so they are starting to get Western goods that are coming in. And I think the younger generations are questioning the old ways, the old values. And they're questioning, you know, these methods of sustainability that have been going, that have been, that have been in place for thousands of years. You know, why, do, why should we do that? Why should we sacrifice um, for, the, for the collective good when there's all these other exciting things going on, there, go, going on out there? So um, a, a big part of it will be, I think, to show the people, or at least convince the people and convince the chiefs that, you know, we're celebrating what you do well we're coming to you for answers, um, things that we've forgotten, and hopefully that's the kind of the trade-off, if you like, or the price of our intrusion. And we will try and make it as, obviously, our footprint as, as minimal as possible in terms of, you know, cameras and all that stuff, which, yeah, I mean, even exposure to cameras, it's like you can just see people's wheels turning, and, uh, but we're, 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 we're going to try and be res as responsible as possible. Right. Um, so do you feel that s some kind of dramatic upheaval, um, like a kind of change to, to the likes of a, of a micro-Earth society is necessary for us in order to you know, continue living, um, to be sustainable? I obviously don't think that that's realistic in a modern, complex society. Uh, but I do think that there is a... I mean, Gianna, you might have some thoughts here in terms of what people... It seems like some people are going to be more motivated by community, the idea of the greater good, and getting involved in, you know, being sort of inspired by uh, being sustainable because it's the right thing to do, and they'll therefore get involved in community or social exchange, perhaps more than uh, economic. And, but then there are going to be, be people who aren't who aren't particularly interested in social exchange and they're only ever going to be uh, influenced by more economic forces, perhaps. How much money they're going to save, um, whether or not it's convenient for them and their family. Um, so I guess micro-Earths might appeal to the former group of people who perhaps, because the global, because the global picture is so uh, overwhelming in terms of what difference we individually can make, um, I think, I think giving, giving, us, giving people uh, mental frameworks to scale the big picture down to something a bit more tangible. Um, I use the analogy of a boat in everything I do in my average day. My wife and I, you know, we're, um, it's like our house is our boat where we live. And we try and think about the fact we're living in this boat and we're, 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 we're really conscious about the resources that we that we consume. Um, so I think for some people that might be a helpful metaphor, the idea of a micro-Earth, but I'm realistic. I, I, I don't know, Gianna, what do you think in terms of a large portion of the population who wouldn't get that necessarily? Mm, I agree with everything that you said. I think that um, in many ways 
the, the, the big societal change that you allude to is probably going to have to be legislated. <laughs> Not, I mean, there, I, I agree that there are ways to make people think differently and want to make a change in their life, but it needs to happen at such a mass level and with corporations, not just individual people, that I think the, um, um, the, the, the challenge is to get governments or even super governmental organizations to um, sort of force change, if you will. And the example that I always like to use is recycling. Um, recycling has become a social norm, right? Everyone does it. I mean, climate change deniers, you know, recycle. It's just something that has become a part of how you live your life. Um, and how did that happen? Well, in many cases, it was legislated at the beginning. People didn't want to. They were forced to. And then over time, it became something that was normalized. I think the big changes that you're alluding to are probably going to have to start like that. Uh, if we just rely on people to sort of come to their own realization that we're all, you know, uh, that, that our daily life patterns are leading to the species doom, I think uh, we probably wouldn't see the large scale change. It seems like people need to beat the, 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 the stick. Mm. People don't want the doom and gloom. I, I mean, not every, um, they, it needs to be aspirational, right? Mm. Sustainability right. needs to be about, you know, what is it, what, how is it going to help me live a, a more fulfilling, happier life? And I think it's possible. W uh, you know, both, both narratives are obviously possible. But I also, I mean, what I, what I can't help feeling from these micro-Earths is because the people are very aware of the limits of their universe, perhaps they're more likely, they're more prepared to sacrifice for other people that they don't, may, may not, i.e. not their immediate family or their kinsfolk. They are prepared to sacrifice for people um, who maybe they don't meet that often or they may never meet either because they're far away or because they haven't been born yet. And I think one of the kind of, I, I can't help feeling it's like, how do, we, how do we expand empathy? How do we expand our empathy to encompass the whole? That seems to me uh, uh, almost impossible, but that seems to me the, one of the main hopes for our species is getting people to care about the bigger picture, um, and yeah, and that's I guess where I feel my role is perhaps. Yes, I think this is one of the things that intrigues me the most about Tikopia and why I can't wait to see uh, what you find because finding societies where people do genuine, genuinely want to sacrifice uh, and share, for example, with uh, with people who aren't not even their relatives um, and engage in the type of social exchange that you alluded to earlier, fairly rare. So understanding more, even from an, uh, yeah, from an exchange perspective about what motivates that and to be able to hopefully take those lessons and use them elsewhere is something that I'm really excited about. But your research would perhaps suggest that that is not realistic in well, terms of the greater population in modern societies, right? I think, and it's not necessarily, yes, it's not necessarily because of who we are as individuals, but it's because of how the system that we live in is set up. So in a modern capitalist society, I think you're incentivized to not necessarily, you know, uh, it's not in your best interest to share what you have with others that you don't know. And so it's, again, so it doesn't necessarily, so to me- Because of lack of trust, essentially? Yeah, I think that's a big part of it. Um, you know, yes. not, not knowing that person and not knowing, yeah, what you're getting or. Yeah, exactly, and so I think people need these indicators of trust uh, and um, which, which are hard to come by. And um, so I think if we can find out from these other societies how, not necessarily how individuals feel, but how the society is set up, then hopefully those can be some lessons that, you know, could, could be transferred perhaps. And perhaps even transferred at scale. I mean, that tricky thing is taking it to s putting it to yeah, scale, true. rather than just twelve hundred people. It's how do you how do you replicate that at scale? True. Yeah. So we have time for one last question. Yes. So you don't know if it's right for it to be last. Um, y you were showing um, the, the boats, um, wind turbine, mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, the, the issue of energy is, is, uh, is typical of others. Um, it, it, it was in the news no, not long ago that 
um, last year for a few months in, uh, in California, uh, Tesla's electric cars had had a smaller footprint than an ordinary car uh, because of the amount of solar energy in California. For most of the year, they actually have a higher footprint. Um, so how, d how do you generate electricity? Some people think, because I'm driving an electric car, I have zero emissions. That's nonsense. Where, where does the electricity come from? So you were talking about um, um, broadcasters, documentary makers, um, um, lawmakers, um, it, so who, uh, biologists, geographers, who has the solutions? I mean, it, the, the issue of numbers, um, what is, what actually works, Let, let's sit down and see, um, this is a biofuels, a very nice concept, but does it work in practice? Do the crops have a higher footprint than the energy we are, ga we are gaining out of them? Who has the real answers? Is it um, physicists, engineers, um, management Everybody, analysts? Everybody, right, sure. Yeah. Who has the real answers? <laughs> <laughs> I think, well, um, I, I, to me, I find um, that while scientists tend to have a lot of great solutions, you need people to implement them. So I, I think that, um, yeah, the, the people who have the power to tell the compelling stories, the social scientists who understand how and why behavior change actually occurs, to me, they have sort of more power um, because that gives insights into how some of the great new technologies that you were mentioning, whether it's you know with different cars, et cetera, but how that will actually be adopted. So it's one thing to come up with them, and then it's another thing to actually get them adopted. So I think, to me, sort of the social scientists and people who understand human behavior have a really important role to play uh, in terms of the types of answers that they have. Mm. So, well, I think that there are uh, quite a lot of other questions that you have for Jason, but I would like to suggest, since we have drinks right outside, uh, that you can ask Jason uh, your remaining questions um, over drinks. I think uh, Tammy would like to say a little bit about uh, the, 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 the book that, the, that Jason brought with him. I'm an American, I really don't need a mic, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, just quickly, I, you, I'm just a very simple person, you know, I'm not well educated, I don't have a lot of experience, but I travel with Jason a lot and I hear people ask your type of question. And I think it's very important as individuals that we don't underestimate ourselves. I think we often get caught up with sustainability thinking, how can I make a difference? How can I really, what does it matter if I'm riding my bike when my next door neighbor has a Hummer? But I do see the exponential growth of change that happens with the individual. And so especially as students, I was talking to Paul, your university president, asking him if you put something in the university Holloway water. I, I don't know about Royal Holloway water because it's just these amazing people that you farm. But I would just suggest that you don't underestimate your own power as a person. Even with Jason, someone will offer him a bottle of water and he'll say, oh, I have my bottle. And you can see the wheels turning and you know that person is never gonna buy another bottle of water. So um, that's just a little tidbit from little me. But um, I wanted to let you in on a little bit of a secret about Jason. He's a very humble man. And after his expedition, he was offered a quarter of a million dollar book advance for the rights to his, his story. And this is a man who had been on a 13 year journey around the planet with no income. So he could have definitely used that money, but he wanted his story to be true. And so he turned all of that down and uh, was actually homeless for a while because of the amount of integrity that he had. So I met him, I started a publishing company so we will have books available, or if, if you want to, you can purchase a book, he'll sign it for you, but he'll definitely be out at the table to ask questions. But I would like to ask you to please buy a quarter of a million dollar book worth of books tonight. That would just, <laughs> you think that would work, honey? That would help, because then we'll use it for the voyage, okay? So it'll go to something good. Anyway, who's next? Thank you, Tammy. Um, 
So yes, we can please have a chat to Jason and also um, uh, get, he will be happy to sign a book for you too. So Jason, thank you so much for coming back to Royal Holloway and uh, sharing your time and your expertise and your adventures with us. Uh, we're really appreciative. So please join me in thanking Jason.